Well, thanks for staying to the end of the school. Um, wow, I think the first time I ever gave a last talk feels kind of like a responsibility to entertain everybody. Uh, we'll see. Um, so I ended on, on this note, um, on the distinguishing between atomic and uh, molecular free Dirac semi-metal, or what I, how I distinguish them. And um, in the last lecture, I, I explained of how I view inverted semi-metals or the Dirac semi-metals um, where the band inversion or the steep bands comes from some kind of chemical bonding as molecular types um, of semi-metals where um, I view things like cadmium arsenide um, which are formally charged balanced that the electron count matches as um, atomic direct semi-metals. Um, and so I, we already went over the molecular ones and just really briefly want to go over the atomic ones so you see the, the difference. Um, this doesn't work. Oh, it's off. Okay. So first of all, let's, let's think about when we can have band crossings. So technically, so as a chemist, we would draw, um, we, Chemists like to think in real space a bit more, so they, they draw a, d a density of states. And so if you have, um, let's say, a transition metal and you have um, these kind of orbital sh um, shells, um, we learn, at least chemists learn pretty early that the S orbitals split up pretty wide and then the D orbitals pretty narrow and the P is something in between. So if you have any kind of open shell system, and with open shell I mean less than 18, 8 or 18 electrons, what we counted before, it's very easy to have band inversions or band crossings in the crystal structure. The thing is that in this kind of open shell systems, you're going to have a lot of them, and you're going to have a very messy electronic structure. So the likelihood that you just have a trivial metal um, is extremely high. So, uh, for example, I drew here um, how an S-band and a P-band usually disperses, and I think this was already mentioned by Claudia, because an S-band usually goes up in energy. If you move away from a gamma point and a P-band down, it's very easy to have a crossing between S and P-bands, but it doesn't mean that we're going to have a really clean direct semi-metal. It just means we have some kind of band crossing very likely. And so what is usually happening in this type of atomic direct semi-metals is that we have a crossing between um, one filled shell up here and the next filled shell which comes lower in energy and then there are not so many overlapping bands. And let me just show you how that works in cadmium arsenide, for example, which was um, the most prominent first Dirac semi-metal discovered. And so if we do count electrons here, we will count a total of 16 electrons and we have two arsenics, so we divide by two. So we have eight per arsenic, so it's a perfect charged balance system. And what we actually get is this little band inversion really between one filled, completely filled charged balance shell and the next one which comes down a little bit in energy. And these, if you think about it, these inversions, they can never be really large, right? They're just two filled shells touching each other. Um, and of course we have some symmetry arguments I put in here why this crossing is, is stable. Of course we need a high symmetry material for these not being gapped. And so we have the same kind of story in sodium-free bismuth. You can also count the electrons, and here it's very simple. You just add them up to eight and just have one bismuth. And again, we have a very tiny band inversion between the filled shell and the next empty one. Okay, so this is just the difference between using um, bonding strengths and therefore some kind of half-filling band to create a drug semi-metals or using um, uh, charged balanced uh, clean materials. Okay, um, now I would like to um, move on to a little bit um, about direct materials um, as a result of non-symorphic um, semi-metals or just like semi, um, or symmetry, I mean. So there's a lot of work of um, filling constraints and when you can have um, a semi-metal based on non-symorphic symmetry. Um, and just very briefly to review, I think you all know non-symorphic symmetry arguments are uh, symmetries that do not uh, conserve spatial origin. So we have some kind of um, glide or a screw axis that enlarges your unit cell. And just because um, I, in my last lecture, I talked a lot about band foldings and how chemists are, um, are viewing this, I think it's kind of the same thing, what non-symorphic symmetry does to your crystal. So we have a smaller lattice and a symorphic one and a larger real space lattice and a non-symorphic one. And what that does to your case space is that um, it just folds the band, similar as we did for the 1D chain of hydrogen atoms in the first virion zone. 
So the thing is, is that, so when we count electrons, when chemists do this, we always do this per formula sum. So if in a non-somorphic crystals we have double amount formula sums, it doesn't really matter. We just count for one um, atom. So if you have a filled band, your Fermi level is up here, and if you fold it, it's still up here. So usually, we have charged balance systems. So often our Fermi level will be here. And in order to have it at the crossing point, we do need a half field band. Um, and although I started the lecture with two examples where it's possible, just want to point out that half field bands, oh, sorry, here's another thing, that half field bands um, often are chemically unstable and that uh, uh, makes the whole kind of endeavor a little bit critical of finding these. Um, semi-metals based on such a half filling. So, you know, just um, in comparison to these atomic drug semi-metals or conventional ones where you, if your Fermi level is here at the crossing point, you, you have a charge balance system. Here you really need some, something like an odd number of electrons per formula, um, which is hard to achieve, especially if you want to have it in a clean fashion, an isolated fashion. So it is easier to stabilize if it overlaps with other bands. So what does usually happen when you have half field bands? So very commonly, materials undergo piles, distortions, or have a charge density wave or something that gaps out your Fermi surface. And from having a half field band, you go back to being a trivial insulator. And that's also, if you remember, in the last lecture, I was talking about the square nets and how the square nets like to distort. So this is the same kind of problem. And there we use some other bands that overlap to stabilize it. And so if you don't have them, the distortion is going to happen. Then often, if you have half felt D shells, what happens is that you get a mod insulating state. So it's also another way to avoid this half filling states and gap out and get a trivial gap. Um, and so before I talk a little bit about how we find ways around this and maybe stabilize non-somorphic materials, I just want to get put a small detour on the very first prediction of a non-somorphic semi-metal and the chemist's view of this because it kind of fills the loop back to my first lecture on chemical principles and how they can help you to understand if a material prediction makes sense. By the way, I want to point out I love this paper because it was the first one pointing out that you can have these um, non-somorphic degeneracies to create direct semi-metals. Um, I just want to point out why this material candidate won't work out. But let's, let's um, talk about the logic here. So silicon dioxide, it's, um, it's a very well-known material. It's quartz. It's like if you have a crystal grass, silicon dioxide. The sand there at the beach is silicon dioxide. Okay, so that's very, um, it exists. Um, and it crystallizes in this non-somorphic crystal structure. If you look at the structure, it has one silicon atom surrounded by four oxygen atoms in a tetrahedral fashion. And this coordination is important for later and has lots of them connected. And so this has this non-somorphic band degeneracy way below the Fermi level at minus 4.5 eV. And um, you might know a quartz crystal is a transparent crystal, so this thing has a gigantic band gap and is of course trivial. So the logic here was if I substitute silicon with bismuth, so, so um, this is one to the right in the periodic table and a little bit down, then I push this non-somorphic degeneracy perfectly to the Fermi level and I get this really nice Dirac-like electronic band structure. And kind of makes sense, right? Now I just added one electron to this. So I filled it, I make the half-filled band, right? So in, it kind of makes sense that you, this was, would work. And then I think the reason why they didn't substitute it with what is on the same level on the periodic table, but use bismuth is that this kind of splitting, which is really flat here, gets a little bit lifted by the, by the heavier atom. Okay. So to have a nicer splitting. Okay, why can't we make this? So I mentioned the Pauling rules in my first talk, that there are rules of sizes of ions and ionic radii ratios for understanding what kind of coordination a crystal can have. So here again are the coordinations, what the Pauling rules give us. And so if you look, so we, this is um, the radii is reported for silicon and bismuth. You can look them up online. Again, at this website, I already showed it last time. Um, and so silicon four plus, so or in silicon dioxide, oxygen is always charged two minus. So if you have two of them, your cation will be four plus. Silicon four plus has um, a tiny radius. So here's um, the coordination number is listed. So it's four, and the uh, the ionic radius 0.26. 
and the radius of oxygen is always 1.4. So if you take, uh, if you divide 0.2 by 1.4, you get something way smaller, the limit for the tetrahedral coordination, so it's fine to put a silicon cation and an oxygen tetrahedra. However, if you look up the radii for bismuth, okay, first of all, you will find bismuth only is listed in three plus and five plus, and I'll come back to this later, so you can't look up four plus. But um, uh, the other point is that even if you take the smallest radius reported here for five plus, which is 0.76, we get a ratio of 0.53, and that is larger than the limit, so there's no way you will ever fit any bismuth cation in a tetrahedra. Okay, it's just not gonna fit. So whatever you make will have um, an octahedral coordination, at least. Okay, and then I just want to briefly mention why there's no bismuth for plus listed in the database. This also has a reason. Um, and this is the so-called inert pair effect, this very famous effect in chemistry, and actually also used a lot for most of the topological materials to exist. And so, so we have this, so chemists have this kind of intuitive prediction, uh, uh, um, description to describe things, and I'm sure there's a very nice mathematical way to show this, but I'm gonna tell you what we learned in our first semester. We kind of learned, okay, nucleus has a positive charge, electrons have a negative charge, a cycle around this, but um, the reason the, the, the electron cloud is so big and they don't get attracted closer to the nucleus is that they shield each other from the charge of the nucleus a little bit. And so, Elec um, S electrons do a really good job in shielding each other from the charge. So when, when you start filling up electrons and, and protons, when you go through the periodic table, as long as you add a proton to your nucleus and you add an S electron, everything is fine. When you start filling P electrons, they don't shield so well anymore, but it's okay. D electrons are even worse. And then if you come filling to, to the F electrons, you really don't shield it anymore from the charge. So once you go here and you start filling up the lanthanoid right row, every element you go further, you add a positive charge to the nucleus and you add an electron which doesn't shield the other ones. So this is the, the effective nuclear charge kind of increases and it pulls the electron cloud closer together. And that's for example the reason why if you look at zirconium and hafnium in the periodic table, they have the exact same size, although usually when you go down you think the atom gets bigger because um, you add more electrons, right? And so, but it has also another effect that once you start, filled all these kind of um, lanthanides here, you, um, you start um, filling up thallium and then uh, lead and then bismuth in the periodic table, they, the six S orbitals get really pulled closer to the nucleus and therefore lower it in energy, okay? And so because the six S electron, because of these shielding effect is lowered in energy so much, this, this is called the inner pair effect. Um, this usually isn't um, emptied out. So thallium would always stay one plus, lead will always stay two plus, and bismuth will always stay three plus, with very few exceptions, okay? And so if you have something which is formerly bismuth four plus, um, you would have a half hit six S band, and that is so unstable that usually you will have if uh, something which is formally three plus and something which is formally five plus, but actually in reality, new um, experiments show that what you have is bismuth three plus twice and then the oxygen doesn't get its minus two oxidation state, what it usually has, because bismuth wants to be three plus so much that even oxygen is um, one minus instead of two minus. And so this is a very, Famous example is barium bismuth oxide, which is an um, insulating material which becomes superconducting if you dope it. And you could call it like that this has a fake half filled band because if you just look at the formula sum, you would think you have bismuth 4 plus and you have a half filled 6S band. And if you, actually, if you put that in a DFD code like this, you will get a metal. But that's not reality, it's a very insulating material. And the reason is exactly that the bismuth. Um, stays three plus and you get some holes on the oxygen state and some charge modulation. Okay, so even if you think you can have a half filled band, you don't necessarily have one and it's a little bit, you have to be, be a bit careful with that. And also in my first lecture, I men mentioned these simple compounds which form bonds to become charged balanced and also these one could appear, pop up if you just wanna do filling constraint search in a database as half filled bands 
but it's also a fake half-filled band. Like we had calcium silicide and said here, we have five electrons per silicon, so that would be two in the S orbitals and then all the three P electrons would be half-filled. But since we said before, these form bonds and these bonds share the electrons, we actually get a semiconductor and not a half-filled material. So what can we do? to stabilize um, half-filled bands and therefore maybe non-somorphic materials. And we already had that in the last lecture. So you said one example were the square nets where we kind of delocalize the charge over the whole network. And this kind of um, allows us to localize this a little bit. And also very importantly, the overlap with these zirconium D states stabilize the square net structure, which otherwise wants to distort. So you can kind of, you can think about it like sodium metal, right? Sodium metal has a half filled 6s bond, one electron in the 6s bond, but there's overlap with the P band, which stabilizes this, this count. Okay. So if you look again at this um, tight binding derived band structure for a square net, we see, okay, we have this crossing. Here we discussed before, but we actually are also supposed to have one non-somorphic degeneracy um, exactly here. So we could use the square net to, um, to find non-somorphic material. And actually, I forgot to list the citation here. I hope I have it later. There was an original prediction from Tron Charlie Kane in 2015 to use the square net for that. Um, oh, that was the end of my first lecture. <laughs> so let's now move to the, to the real um, first, uh, second one. Um, before I go back, um, I, I later will return to non-somorphic materials and then what, what is happening and if you can realize in them scrannet net materials. But I kind of, so my second lecture was um, about the whole process, how we can get an idea of what could be a new topological materials and the steps we go through to have experimental verification. So basically, when we get an idea, okay, hey, this could be a cool material, we can still use some of the chemistry concepts I used the full first lecture to talk about to design it, can use some DFT to see if it, the, the prediction makes some kind of sense. And this part of the lecture, I want to talk a lot about the synthesis. How do we actually make them when we have a good idea? And then the characterization. This is an important step, diffraction, because I think, I don't know, I talked to Mois over dinner and he said something like, oh, I forgot the number, but a really high number of materials in the ICSD are not that trustworthy. So it makes sense to reinvestigate the crystal structure. Um, so whatever you used as input for your calculation is actually what came out of, the, of your synthesis. And then if you're sure you made what you wanted, you can go ahead and measure properties and see it, if it has the properties you were looking for. Um, so there are a few common crystal growth methods you can use. Um, so we are, the, my group is a crystal growing group and I wanna go over the most common ones and just show some pictures so you get an idea how that process works. Um, I mean, the, the point about crystal growing is really a lot of fine tuning and finding parameters, how to get the biggest crystals out there and you kind of need to like that. It's very rewarding if you have a chunk of crystal in your hand at some point and you made that. Um, and if you like this, it's a lot of fun, but it's a lot of hard work finding, finding out the parameters. Um, I want to start discussing vapor transport method a little bit because if you can use that, that's usually the best one to get a nice crystal. Um, and it's a very simple principle. You have some solid reactants and you have some gaseous transport agents and these together form an intermediate gaseous compound and um, you have a colder temperature so a zone where you get um, single crystals then. And so these, these materials can, if you can use that, um, it's a really nice um, way to grow materials and often it works out with any kind of compounds which contain these elements um, um, of the, the periodic table. Um, as a transport agent, you need to use something which is a gas at high temperature. So you often use the halide. So this is um, iodine here, which is a solid at room temperatures, but as soon as you heat it a little bit, it becomes this fun purple gas. You can put it in a tube. And that's actually kind of nice to use because it's a solid when you start using it. So you can put a solid in your reaction vessel um, and then seal it and then it's a gas later. Sometimes that doesn't work, then you might need to go to bromine, which is a liquid at room temperature and super corrosive, so that's already a little bit more annoying. And then you, you have to usually seal your container with a hot flame and you have a corrosive liquid in there, so that's already less fun to do, but still possible. But if, you, if nothing works 
maybe you have to go to chlorine and that really sucks because that's the gas and it's super, super toxic and you kind of don't want to breathe it in. So you can try um, to find a way around it by um, using things like um, selenium tetrachloride that with the powders and if you heat them, they um, decompose to gaseous selenium or, um, or and chlorine gas. So you kind of do it in situ. Or you can use things like ammonium chloride here, which decompose to um, ammonia and HCl. So it's a different type of transport agent, but you can also use hydrochloric acid gas as a transport agent. So um, these ones work for, um, for different kinds of um, materials to grow. And here, I mean, there are some famous ones you can grow like this. For example, just Frank mentioned ruthenium chloride in the, in the talk before. So these are usually grown, these, these kind of transport agents. Um, and then, yeah, so you, you, you can collect some crystals at the end of your tube. And if you, if you don't, are not happy with your result, what you can do is you can take one of your small crystals and place them in the end of the tube as a seed and then use the seed to grow even larger crystals around that. So that's often a good method to really get the jewelry sized uh, chunk crystals um, out of um, a material. Um, yeah. Um, no, vapor transfer is pretty fast, so it really depends on your compound. So zirconium silicon sulfide, you can grow sizable crystals in a week. If you do three weeks, they're bigger. Um, but then, for example, we would grew some other calcogenides and we put them in three weeks and you have tiny, tiny things. So it really depends some on the kinetics of each individual um, reaction. Yeah, yeah, t uh, vapor transfer is relatively fast. So that's a really nice thing about it. And especially if you use the seed method, you can increase the time. Um, so here are some real pictures from my lab about vapor transport growth. So this is the type of furnaces you use. They have a tube furnace, so you can have a temperature gradient in there. So this is a cheap version of doing it where we just have one heating zone in the middle and naturally there will be a temperature gradient. So, but you can also have more expensive furnaces where you have two heating zones that you can put at different temperatures. That's a more careful control of it, but also much more expensive to set up. So here you see what the tube, the end of the tube is kind of sneaking out of the furnace, so it's colder there. Um, then this is how it looks in the end. This is a tube where we seal the samples in, and here, uh, I don't know how well you can see it, but there's a crystal in the middle, which is a few millimeters in size already. Um, and these are a different kind of, um, this is um, chromium chloride, which is also, I think, famous to be one of the 2D magnetic materials you can use. So you, some of these crystals, they grow really nice and really fast. Just want to point out, it's not always that easy. So this is an example of an explosion of a quartz tube that happens quite frequently too. So this used to be a transparent vessel like this and something reacted and then Sometimes it happens that right? we have an explosion and then a fireball shoots out of this tube in the furnace and that's kind of scary. So um, you kind of need to be a little bit careful, know what you're doing and maybe don't put the furnace next to your off uh, desk or something. Um, Okay, so yeah, I advertise vapor transfer a lot because it's actually my preferred method to grow something, but there are some limitations. First of all, you can't grow anything with vapor transport, but even some things that you can grow with vapor transport, this is not the best method to grow a material. Um, a good example is cadmium arsenide, famous direct semi-metal. And so here, this is a, a binary phase diagram of compounds, so you have um, basically here is everything arsenic, here is everything cadmium, and this is all the phases you can have at different temperatures. And if you look at um, cadmium free arsenic 2, which is the compound we like as a direct semi-metals, we have an alpha prime, an alpha double prime, another alpha, so we have lots of phases. It's a point. And so if we do vapor transport, we kind of we have a temperature gradient, right? So we have a temperature window. Oh, here's a better phase even. So it's really hard to just grow one phase of this. So whenever you grow cadmium arsenide and vapor transfer, you do get really large and nice crystals, but the properties kind of suck because it's really hard to not have a, some kind of grain boundaries between different phases and everything. And if you grow cadmium arsenide from a flux, and I'm going to tell you later how that works, you get really high uh, triple R ratios, which is an indication of low defect concentration. And this is when, these are the crystals where the ultra high mobility and everything was observed. So 
sometimes you got to go to a different method. And um, tanks and itellerite is another example, where it's a famous type 2 wire semi-metal, was the first one showing the really high magneto resistance. And here, um, so this is a, a plot of the triple R ratio versus the, the mag, um, MR ratio measured in the crystals or also the mobility. And these crystals here on the lower end were grown with vapor transfer, and then these ones here with flux growth, and they're much more superior in their qualities. So why is that? Okay, so flux growth, that's, I, actually this is a fun, method. I mean I like vapor transfer because it's so convenient, but flux growth is the most fun to do. Because how it works is you have your tube, quartz tube vessel, and you put in solid stuff, which becomes liquid at really high temperature. So you kind of have a solvent, which is a liquid metal or a liquid salt. And then it's kind of, you know, I mean, you probably, once you had a beaker with water and you dissolve salt in it and you put some kind of feed, like um, something in where the crystals grow, I forgot, I'm lacking a word now. Um, anyways, and then uh, you, out of the salt solution, you can grow a crystal. So this is doing this um, at higher temperatures with things where you can't use water as a solvent. So you really, you use liquid bismuth or liquid lead as your solvent and you cool very slowly and on the slow cooling you grow out a crystal out of the smelt and here you put a filter in the tube and at really high temperatures and I mean like between, depending what kind of you use, 300 Celsius to up to 1000 Celsius, you take out your container and put it upside down in a centrifuge and the liquid metal gets out and the crystals stick in your filter. And uh, here's the process, how it looks in my lab. So this is a, a telluride we grow out of a tellurium cell flux. So here's the tube before, um, and there's uh, solid tellurium chunks in it, and then the little tiny amount of the other elements we want to make. So we put it in a furnace in some kind of um, a crucible, so it stands upside down, and then it gets out, so we heat it, and we slowly cool it until a temperature where tellurium is still liquid. We take it out with a tongue, put it upside down in this awesome centrifuge, which was like a hundred bucks on eBay, but works. So I'm still a fan of this thing. Um, and close the centrifuge, centrifuge down the, the liquid. And then you see here in the tube, you see, so this was how it was before. Here was the filter. Here it's, this is where it's sealed. And now this filter is kind of junky. Here's the liquid tellurium on the end. And then here in this end, are your red shiny crystals. This is how they look when you take them out. Um, and actually, if you don't find crystals, you can just put it back in and try a different kind of temperature profile to, to get better crystals. Yeah? How do you then control the like, temperature decrease in the centrifuge? It's a quench. Yeah, so this is basically quenching it down. And this is actually the disadvantage for flux growth. So sometimes um, this causes more defects. Also, the centrifuging is pretty rough to your materials, um, but if you have the competing phases, like it was in cadmium arsenide, it's still the better method to, to do. And for tungsten ditelluride, um, I think the huge excess of tellurium helps to control tellurium vacancies, which are the most common defects. So you, sometimes you gotta try both and see which one gives you the better crystals. But yeah, flux growth definitely has a problem with the sudden quench and the, the force on the centrifuging. But so the sudden quench is important because, you know, when we, when we, so it's actually a good point. So here we said, because we need a temperature window for vapor transport, we will get several of the phases. But if you do, if you do a flux growth, you start cooling the melt from here. And then when you, when you just have the, only this um, phase you want, I think it's the alpha prime is the one you want, then um, you sit at this temperature for a while and make sure everything is in this phase and you take it out right away. And so it quenches and it doesn't form the other phases as side product. Okay, um, yeah, you can also use salt fluxes to um, um, grow crystals. This is usually done for oxides, um, like optical crystals are often grown like this, and there's this kind of um, methods where you have a feed rod, and you heat just, you have a little flux here, and you heat a zone, and you can grow gigantic crystals like this out of um, transparent oxides, and that is often used for, for optical applications. They're really industry focused on this kind of crystal growth. And so these are, um, if you don't do um, oxides, these are the elements which you can use at flux, as metal fluxes. They all have relatively low melting temperatures. So you can um, use all these elements as a solvent to grow a crystal out. Um, oh yeah, then there's the Bridgman method. This is actually, 
a kind of nice way to grow a crystal, but not possible for um, many materials, but most family, uh, f famously bismuth selenide and the, these kind of topological insulators are grown this way. And here you just have a melt um, in a, a furnace with different temperatures and you move your melt slowly through the different temperature zones to very, very slowly cool your melt. But that only works if your phase diagram, if you have again, looks like that here, that you have a straight line all the way down to your phase diagram because you slowly cool everything. If you have any kind of competing phase on the way here down, you'll get a phase mis mixture. So you can't do it with every material, but if you can go do it, it's, it's a very good way to get gigantic crystals. Okay, so then we said, so I want to go through the whole loop of, of the process of doing it. So now we grew a really light, uh, huge crystal and we're happy. About, um, but now the next question is, does it cleave? Because both ARPIS and SDM, that what Heim uh, talked about, need a really fresh and clean surface, so you can grow a perfect crystal. If you can't cleave it, you will still have problems using one of the common techniques to verify the electronic structure. So it's, it's really nice if you have something which is layered because then you get a flat plate, you can glue it on this kind of metal holder for ARPIS and you, you glue another stick on top of it with a glue, you put it in your vacuum chamber, you put it in UHV, and you have a wobble stick to knock up the stick on top and you have a really nicely cleaved surface. If it works, it's great. Um, I did cut out nearly everything about ARPIS because I ran out of time last time and I want to finish the lecture. Um, so if you want to learn more about ARPIS, then talk to me afterwards or something. Um, but the basic principle is that you bombard your surface with, with photons um, and you use the photoelectric effect to eject electrons and based on the kinetic energy as well as the angle in your detector, you can use these two equations to um, convert the um, energy to the binding energy in your materials and your um, kinetic energy to your momentum space and you get a really nice, basically a photograph of your electronic structure. Okay, I just wanna keep on going with giving you a few examples of the for loop from um, some materials we, that came out of um, uh, my group, basically. Um, so let's start with the idea. Um, I already talked a lot about square nets and and the conium silicon sulfide and where it was all coming from. I just want to take a moment to highlight the original papers that get me, gave me the idea to look for it. And this was um, Roald Hoffman, who I already talked a lot about, um, uh, who did all the interest, uh, chemistry way for band structures, together with Wolfgang Kremel, which is still funny to me because he was, uh, he was my gen chem teacher, actually. So when I was an undergrad, um, I took his lectures and he taught me about in organic chemistry. So those two, they wrote a paper when I was just alive um, and they looked at square nets and they said, oh, square nets always do pious distortions as we already discussed because they have this kind of um, crossing here which gives them an unfavorable electronic band structure with some density of states. So it's much uh, more energetically favorable to have the zigzag structure and have a gap surface. And I was like, when I was reading this paper, I was like, hmm, but why are they, they always wrote something like this. So this would be the electronic structure of material X if it would be in the zirconium silicon sulfide structure. And looks perfect, right? And so then, therefore, I wanted to look for zirconium silicon sulfide and I saw it was reported in the undistorted structure. Nobody ever looked at the electronic structure and anything. So I was wondering, does it have the, uh, the features the paper predicts? Um, and what, is, what I also liked about it, so when you look at the crystal structure for the first time and you think it might be something cool, and you see something like that, like a layer of two of the same elements touching each other, then it's a really good indication that this material might be cleavable, very important for, for future investigations. Also, what is really, really nice, what I notice if, if you want to uh, introduce a material to a community which has a lot of impact, it's very useful if it's air stable and easy to handle because then everybody else will work on it. Whereas, I mean, how many papers are there from sodium free bismuth? This uh, basically turns into a white powder within seconds, not many, right? Because it's very hard to do. So this one was reported to be air stable and even stable in um, diluted acids, so it's super stable. Um, and it was also only uh, composed of non-toxic elements, which you might not, 
immediately think it's so important, but actually when you, for example, I once wanted to grow cadmium arsenide as a service growth, and then I managed to blow up the tube in the furnace. They said that sometimes happens, and that really sucks if you do that with cadmium arsenide, because both of these things are super toxic. You have to clean up the mess. You can't really use the furnace anymore. You put on your mouth breather, your coat, everything like this. You pack the whole furnace in a back and throw it away. So it's not really great. So if the codium silicon sulfide explodes, we're fine, okay? So um, that's also uh, what I really liked about this material. Um, anyways, yeah, we are, I already showed the band structure. It does have all the nice crossings and we already discussed, uh, discussed where they came from. So that was all great. Yes, yeah, so now the thing is, okay, so when I, when I looked at this material, it was only known in a powder form, so it wasn't reported in any kind of single crystal yet. So how do you grow it? Okay, it has sulfur in it. Sulfur is a carcogenite. Carcogenites are usually grown with vapor transport. So my first guess was vapor transport. And it was great because it worked right away. Um, you're not always that lucky in life, but this time it was really good. So you put, I put just the elements, the conium, silicon, and sulfur in a tube. Um, I used iodide as a transport agent just as my first shot because iodide, as I said, is the easiest to handle. You just scoop it in with a spatula in your tube. And I chose 1100C for some reason I forgot. And I put the end at 900C and I got really nice crystals based on this direction. So here you see pictures of the crystals. They're pretty, they can be several centimeters, in, uh, several millimeters in size. Sometimes, um, yeah, so sadly, I didn't take a picture of the biggest one I ever grew, and I once grew one which had like a square centimeter square. Anyways, they grow nicely. Um, they also do cleave nicely. This is a picture of a uh, fresh cleaved surface, so, so this is all good. Um, then I can't stress enough how important it is to verify the crystal structure. So this crystal structure was solved in the 60s, and it turned out to be right, but often it doesn't happen. And as I said, there was kind of some kind of trick with the square net. Like if the square net was actually distorted and not real light, we don't have the band structure and it shouldn't be stable. So it was really important that we check that it's really the structure it has. And so there are lots of um, diffraction met methods you can use. I chose to, um, to, so we did them all, but I'm showing here electron refraction just because it's so nice to look at. So these are measured electron diffraction patterns in the TEM, and then you can simulate based on the CIFI from the ICSD how it should look like, and then you see a very perfect match. But we also did single crystal diffraction on the other ones. Then we looked at it under the electron microscope, and the, I love this because nowadays they're, they're so good, you can really resolve the individual atoms. So you can see your silicon atoms here where they're supposed to be, and here your uh, zirconium and sulfur ones, and you actually you see this white kind of planes, which is where the sample cleaves, and you kind of can see the gaps. And you can look at it under the SDM to get some kind of idea of a defect um, concentration, so the bright spots are defects, and then you can count them, and you get an idea how defective the crystal is, and this was my very first really crappy attempt, and I already had a pretty low defect concentration on it. We improved the growth much more afterwards. All right, great, so we put it in the Arpis machine, and to cleave it and to see if the band structure is what everyone see, and we did see really steep linear dispersed bands as we predicted. These are the dashed purple lines here, um, but we did see a lot of other states we didn't expect, um, and because ARPIS is an extremely surface sensitive method, we were suspecting from the beginning that this might be a surface state since the penetration depth of the photons you shoot on isn't very deep in the sample. So you can just um, compare it with um, a DFT calculation of a material where you put some artificial vacuum in to also simulate the surface. And once we did that, we had an extremely perfect match of um, uh, measured data and, and calculated data. And so this was our first experiment, but since then this has been um, confirmed a billion times that the structure is correct. Yeah? No, 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 we first did the crystal structure, then we did the Yeah. So, so here, this was the crystal structure, then we looked at it, we even looked at it in real space, then we put it in the ARPIS machine. Um, okay, and then, so the nice thing is we had confirmed that this has the electronic structure um, we wanted, and we, I already showed you this complicated figure last time, and here's just a more simple table of materials that 
la listed in the ICSD and I immediately uh, um, pop out to you that they're isoelectronic and isostructural and you should also uh, be able to invest. And I didn't do all of them, lots of other people did, but most of, at least the ones up here, have been shown now to have this same kind of electronic structure. Um, okay, let me go back to non-somorphic materials. I said the square nets might also be a good idea to look for non-somorphic crossings, and because we needed a half-filled band, and this was kind of a, a way to stabilize this half-filled band. Here was the, the band structure with um, the Fermi leg will exactly at this point. Um, but if we look at the band structure again of zirconium silicon sulfate, we see this band crossing at X, which was predicted in the tight binding to be at the Fermi level, is actually like about half a dB, a bit more below the Fermi level and above the Fermi level. And this crossing here, which was in a tight binding level below, is moved up to the Fermi level. Okay, and the reason for this is because this was just modeled on a simple square net of half-filled atoms, but in reality, this is a 3D crystal, and there are some three-dimensional interactions which shift the bands a little bit. But, I mean, if you look at the R perspective, we do see at the X point, we see this nice crossing superimposed with the surface state, um, so it's definitely there, and it's much closer to the Fermi energy compared with uh, silicon dioxide, which we had in the beginning. It was way down there, so these seem to be accessible. So we were wondering if we look at these ISO structural and isoelectronic materials, if we can somehow move this crossing closer to the Fermi level by going into a more two-dimensional structure. So we, we did DFT on all the isoelectronic ones, and um, we made a plot, chemist's law, like kind of structure map plots, where on the, um, on the axis here is the C to A ratio. So it's basically how long is the C axis compared to the A axis, and the larger this gets, the more two-dimensional we should get because the larger we separate the layers. And then here on the Y axis, we plot the energy of these two crossings. So the lower non-somorphic touching point here is the, um, is the orange dots, and the higher ones are the blue ones. And then you see this upper one comes down to the Fermi level exactly in zirconium silicon telluride and hafnium silicon telluride. By the way, so these are the two outliers. All these have about the same C to I A ratio, and these ones have artificially really high, oh, not, no, I mean, not artificially, these ones have just very high C to A ratios. Um, and then you move the cone. So we looked at zirconium silicon telluride. So here's the DFT, so this, um, this touching comes really to the Fermi level. Um, this is the other crossings, they're still there. Now that this is the other direct crossings we have, so it's a little bit wiggled around. We have some pockets, but it's a relatively clean version of a material for non somorphic touching point at the Fermi level. So we grew it again with vapor transport. This time it was a little bit more criti critical. We had to crunch the samples to make it, so we had to need a bit more time to figure it out. This is a crystal on a, uh, here's a crystal on an optical microscope, here's one under the SD, SEM, and you see it's more two-dimensional right away, like it starts peeling off here just by itself. It's much more layered. Also, when I looked at this recently, I thought maybe this is a screw dislocation, I don't know. Anyways, this is about <laughs> not of the point after I listened to Heim's talk. And we again did all the structure characterizations and the TEM, and we are sure this is the material. Um, we, we measured ARPIS again, um, but so we expected the non-somorphic crossing point at the X point at the Fermi level, but here's not really, there's not a real point at X. We found the lower one where it's supposed to be at minus 300 um, electron volts. There's a point here, not really. So we looked at the dispersion. So compared with a slab cal uh, calculation, it becomes a bit more complicated again. The point should be here at the Fermi level. In reality, the Fermi level is a little bit Below that, we have a little bit of P defects in the material. But then if we put some potassium on the surface, we can really nicely see this touching point here exactly at the Fermi level. Okay, and then the last thing I wanted to show is, so what, now we have a system we can play with, perfect for the chemist, right? We have the square net compounds and we can pick all the different ones and we have ingredients from, from, from everywhere and we can try to, to make many more materials with many different properties. And so I started wondering, can we make these things magnetic? So now we had only non-magnetic topological nodal line semi-metals, can we add magnetism and therefore do some kind of time reversal symmetry breaking or something? And so it, down here, on this structural maps are compounds 
that contain rare earth elements like land phenomena and other ones. And um, once you, you go one away from land phenomena periodic stable, you start filling the F states and F electrons are usually very localized. And so the likelihood that these materials order magnetically is pretty high. Um, so these materials were known, they're reported in the database, nobody ever measured any properties, so I had no idea if they actually are magnetic, but I thought it's worth a try. Here's important that you confirm the crystal structure. So we looked and we, we made cerium antimony telluride, so here, this one. This is just the, f the first rare earth which should order magnetically. We picked the simplest one. And there were two entries in the database. P4 over NMM space group, which is isostructural so zirconium silicon sulfate, and PN over MM, PNMM, which is all rhombic and therefore doesn't have a scran net anymore. And so we, we did uh, do neutron diffraction on it, and we do, do, do a perfect fit, and we find it to be tetragonal here. But I just want to show it to you. It doesn't come out well on the slides. Uh, so here's the, the electron diffraction again. And if you zoom in into these spots, you see that here's a number of spots. And these are very faint on the projectors. But in the orthorhombic ones, there are extra spots that should appear in between them. And they just really don't. So it's another proof. Yeah? Oh, no, it's very high energy electron, like KEV electrons that get bombed on that, yeah. Hmm? Yes, yes, yes. It doesn't only get its surface, yeah. Um, and so this, this would be the um, band, so then does it, we were interested if the band structure still sh shows the features for this isoelectronic compound, so this was as a band structure of uh, this compound, if we ignore any magnetism and we just ignored the F states, we put them into the core states. Maya actually did the calculation. Um, and so we do have a non-somorphic touching point here at the Fermi level. We do have this gapped line nodes that gapped a bit higher now because spin orbit coupling is higher and spin orbit coupling gapsies. And we get another tilted direct crossing along the gamma Z line. So we confirmed with ARPIS that the band structure roughly looks what it's supposed to do. It kind of matches the prediction pretty well of the surface terminated band structure anymore. But now, okay, we didn't know if it was magnetic yet. So, um, so we, put, uh, we checked the magnetic properties and indeed if you measure temperature dependent susceptibility in a, in a um, low magnet applied field, we get a really nice cusp-like transition indicating that this is an anti-ferromagnetic uh, phase transition. And then if you start applying higher fields in our MT curves, we get, um, we, this cusp goes away and we get something which looks either para or ferromagnetic-like. So we wanted to understand it a little bit better. And when we did um, field-dependent measurements, you see here we see some really stark jumps at a small field of about a quarter Tesla. So that means that we have a field-induced magnetic transition in these samples. And if you apply just a tiny a field, we switch the order from anti-ferromagnetic to a fully pol polarized kind of ferromagnetic-like phase. Um, we wanted to, so, for, so first of all, we wanted to prove that the magnetic structure is what we think with neutron diffractions, but also we wanted to solve the anti-ferromagnetic structure. So if you want to understand what magnetism does to your material, you need to know the exact magnetic structure that was not known. So we shipped the sample to the UK and there some really great scientists there performed neutron diffractions on the sample below the anti-ferromagnetic transition at 1.5 Kelvin. And here's the, the fit to it. And this is the structure they solved based on the data. So it means it, it shows that your spins are ferromagnetically aligned within one of these planes. And then the next plane is coupled anti-ferromagnetically. But then this kind of dimer couples anti-ferromagnetically again to that one. So it means the whole sample here has a doubled C-axis. So it's a twice as many atoms in the unit cell. So this was our old unit cell. Okay, and this really matters for symmetry because we, we were looking at non-somorphic symmetry degeneracies and we now kind of add some kind of uh, screw-like non-somorphic translation along this direction. Just to summarize, this is um, the magnetic phase diagram we derived from all the data we had and a lot of samples. So we have an anti-ferromagnetic region with a double unit cell here. We have a fully polarized phase up here and a paramagnetic phase here. So we can 
access a lot of different phases in this material. And so Maya did a group theory analysis based on, um, which you probably learned earlier in the school, um, wh what kind of degeneracies you expect from the symmetries at each point. And I mean, it's not really surprising that in all the, first of all, in the paramagnetic phase, we have fourfold at these different, uh, four different points in the brilliant zone, and that was known from the zirconium silicon sulfide to appear in the structure type. And in the ferromagnetic phases, it's not really surprising that um, you get um, two, uh, they split into two folds. But what was surprising at the time is that the anti ferromagnetic phase we had, because we add the symmetry element and we double the unit cell, um, has um, eight fold degeneracies at the A point predicted. So that means if you go cool for a uh, magnetic phase transition, you can change your symmetry enough to to join two fourfold irreducible presentations of the band to an eightfold. And we've confirmed that we all see this, we see all this kind of splittings in the DFT as predicted. Sadly, the eightfolds comes down here at minus five EV, so it's not really that accessible. But um, the point we made at the time is that um, it's really important to closely look at your magnetic structure. And I think uh, that is something where there's still a lot of work to do from, chemist, from the chemist side because not so many ma magnetic structures are reported and out there. And with this, I'm at the end. So I just want to summarize with an outlook that materials based on a square net can, so we found one kind of system. And I said chemists like to look for structural motifs in the very beginning. So we found the square net as a structural motif to find all this kind of um, interesting topological semi-metal phases. And we can tune the properties quite a bit, add magnetism, shift the features around by um, changing elements to make the structure more 2D. Um, and we also found a way to plot a structure map to figure out where the good materials lay. And we can extend that to other structures containing the square net. Um, and lastly, what is a very, what we're probably going to do next is that we, find, we figure, we color this periodic tables of which elements can be in which positions in, the, um, in these types of materials. And there are some gaps in here. So why is there no compound with indium? Why is there no compound with boron? So very next obvious question for the chemist is can we make materials that are not in the ICSD that fulfill these kind of properties? And then with this, I'm done. Maybe I could have talked about our I don't know. <laughs> Seems I have more time. Do you have questions? Sorry, how um, I don't really understand. So, so the mathematical analysis based on this idealized notion of the crystal. In, in general, how close are the new materials? Well, if you really use the correct crystal structure as an input for DFT, it's, if you don't have interactions, often close, right? But if you put a tight binding model just of a square net, it really depends on the structure, how it gets modified. So, like we showed that. Here in these materials, the square net is rather isolated from the other things, so you see the features, but we still saw the non somorphic crossing point with moving. It was still a little bit modified, but at least what the tight binding predicts is somehow there, whereas up here it's, it's not at all because this is way too much 3D and the square net doesn't play a role anymore. So really, you have to find the structural parameters to separate the good ones from the bad. Um, that's neutron diffraction. So um, unlike X-rays that diffract from um, um, the electron cloud of um, of your electron your neutrons diffract from the nucleus, and then they're also sensitive to the spin and the magnetic moment. So, so here's the diff this spectrum, for example, is the difference what they measure between five Kelvin, where it's not magnetic, and 1.5 Kelvin, where it is magnetic. And these peaks you see are extra. Um, magnetic Bragg peaks that appear because the neutrons diffract, uh, are also diffracted by the spin. Mm -hmm. but, uh, have you found, uh, on the 
Magnetic one? Yeah, it's currently um, undergoing. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay. I'm curious, uh, how much have you been investigated for other correlation properties like superconductivity and so on? Is that part of your routine screening for materials? Or? Um, well, I mean, we check until 2 Kelvin and we can't go much lower, so then uh, I'm happy to ship crystals everywhere around who wants to, to see for other things, yeah. Good, well, that's fantastic. Thank you. Thank you.